I'd like to talk to you today about the spider. Now, I know not everybody's uh, very happy and with close contact with spiders, but there are some things that we know about them that are really amazing. And I'd like to share those with you in this talk. Now, I particularly want to talk about web spinning spiders. You see, there are, there are many, many different types of spiders. Some of them chase after their prey and gobble them up. Some set traps for them in the ground and they, their enemies fall down the hole and they gobble them up. But the ones we want to look at today are called orb spiders, the ones that make webs to catch their flying prey, insects and so on. And we see this very often in our gardens in the UK. Here's a, a, a picture showing how beautiful the construction of these webs can be. This picture uh, is taken, as you can see, in a, in a garden. Now, it's surprising how many spiders there are in our gardens. We wouldn't realise it unless we somehow see the, the webs, perhaps on a cold October morning where they shine out. I've got this picture here. This is my front hedge outside the house. You can see it's covered with webs. Now, those webs were always there. But because it's a very cold morning and, and there's a bit of a fog, it, it's the droplets of moisture have formed on the web itself and it's become visible. And of course, from the spider's point of view, this means today it will go hungry because no self-respecting insect would fly into a web that stands out like that, would they? Normally, they're quite invisible. Well, spiders that make webs depend on silk. And silk really is a wonder substance. Um, the life of the spider entirely depends on silk. And it, has, it really is an amazing material. Did you know spider silk is five times stronger than steel of the same weight. That's pretty strong, isn't it? If you had three kilograms of silk, you could stretch it out and it would make a line that would stretch all the way around the world, 24,000 miles. Strip silk from spiders can actually stretch up to five times its own length without breaking. And that's pretty unusual. Here's a micro photograph of a strand of spider silk. Now, this is measured in micrometers. A micrometer is a millionth of a meter. So this is about like three millionths of a meter wide, a single strand of spider silk. And this is how you can stretch it. You can go on stretching it. This line here on here uh, expresses how, how far it's stretched. And this one here is how what pressure is being put on the end of the silk to stretch it more and more. And it goes up in a straight line without breaking. Isn't that amazing? Most substances, even most man-made substances, would was, was, uh, tear to pieces long before that. Also, silk, spider silk, is elastic. And that's important too, because when it spins its, spins its web and the insect comes along, it wants to be able to slow down that insect without breaking the strands of silk. So it has to be elastic. And they calculated, you know, it's a bit of a joke, really. If you had a spider's web the size of a fishing net, it will be able to stop an airliner, something like this. It's only a joke, of course. Now, there are actually six different kinds of silk that the spider can switch on at will. It can decide which one to make. What are these six types of silk? Well, here's a, a picture of the spider at the top there. And these are the silk glands in its abdomen. Separate ones, six of them, which all make different kinds of silk. So there's silk for making scaffolding for the web, there's silk for making the sticky part of the web, there's silk for making, uh, protecting its eggs, and so on. Let's just go through those one by one. Perhaps the most important one from the point of view of safety for the spider is the dragline silk. This is the one that it extrudes from its abdomen the moment you flick it in the air and it starts to fall to the ground. It can stretch this out from its abdomen and slowly break itself and land safely on the ground perhaps many metres below. Here's a photograph in, in my garden of the dragline silk coming from the abdomen. That's come to a branch of a tree and it's already safely on its way down, like a, an abseiler coming down a cliff, something like that. So that's the dragline silk. The special silk, very strong silk, which is used for making the framework of a web. We'll come to that in a, in a little while. And then there's a, a sticky kind of silk, which it needs to trap the insects. No good having a springy silk uh, where the insect will simply bounce out of the web, it has to be sticky silk so that it gets trapped uh, in time for the spider to eat it. So here's, here's a close-up photograph 
uh, each of these sort of globules of of uh, sticky stuff about ten micrometers in length and strung out along the the, the, the strand. Okay. Then there's a, a special kind of strong silk which it needs in the very beginning of web making to anchor the web to the trees or to the ground at the bottom. This kind of silk here, really strong, like a rope, really, to take the weight of the whole thing. And then there's the silk it needs to wrap around insects if they happen to fly into its web. Here's a picture of an unfortunate <laughs> grasshopper that managed to get caught in the web. And you can see the spider's busy spinning this very soft silk around it to immobilize its prey. And then, of course, it will inject it with, with poison and, and gobble it up. And there's another kind of silk it only uses very occasionally, and that's to make a strong cocoon to protect its eggs when it wants uh, to, to re reproduce. So here's a little picture of a sack uh, of silk. There's two spiders stuck on the outside there. Inside are the eggs, which will hatch out into thousands of baby spiders. So it's six types of silk, a line to jump to safety, lines to make the framework of a web, sticky lines to trap the insects that go into the web, a very strong silk to attach the web to its branches on the ground, and soft silk to wrap insects when they are caught, and finally, a special kind of silk for making its egg banks when it comes to reproduce. Again, here's another diagram showing you a bit more detail, these amazing glands in the abdomen of the spider. You can see they're slightly different because they're all for different purposes. But they extrude these different kinds of silk. Silk for um, so a drag line, there's a drag line. Silk for uh, the egg sacs, which we looked at. Silk for the strong construction part of the web. How the spider makes silk is really still an unknown secret. It all revolves around what we call the spinnerets. Scientists know that silk is actually made from two separate proteins which have to be mixed together a bit like that kind of glue you buy in two, two tubes and mix it together to make a strong glue a bit like that and these two proteins are stored in liquid form in special glands inside the abdomen the spider now when it's needed these two liquids are mixed together and pulled out through very special tubes in the spinnerets called spigots and this is where it then sets into a solid straight away so quickly, it is able to support the weight of the spider, the drag line one, when it's falling to the ground. It's really fast. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we had a, uh, a safety patch like that for, for mountain climbers who could sort of attach themselves to a rock and, and be safely floated down to the ground as they started to fall? Now, those spinnerets and those little spigots foam and vibrate the liquid as it comes out. And that seems to be an essential part of the, the process. So here again, a close up of those spinnerets. Uh, and these are the actual uh, points from which the silk emerges. And uh, here's another diagram. There's the silk glands, there's the spinnerets, there's a close up of a spinneret. Now, see here, a close up of a spinneret. This is a spigot here. And it has a muscular valve here. So as the silk flows out through the spigot, it sort of vibrated backwards and forwards like that. And that seems to change its composition to make it much stronger. Actually, when you look at spider silk under an ultra microscope, you can see it's made up of a mixture, a mixture of uh, chains of spring-like material mixed with quite hard crystals, uh, which are which are joined together by these, these spinnerets. That's how it's made. Here's a, an interesting photograph, micro photograph, close up of the spinnerets. And you can see them starting to extrude this liquid silk from the tips. Here's a, here's a picture a bit later on where you can see the silks flowing out from these spinnerets, merging together into a strong strand of fibre. Uh, now, we know it's a quite a complex structure. It's, it seems it has little blocks of molecules which are zigzags, and they're linked together by these tiny fibres. So when you stretch the silk, those little zigzags unravel and become straight. And when you let go, they get back to the same shape they had originally. They go back to the same shape they had when the silk's relaxed. Uh, again, here's a micro photograph. There's a little uh, zigzag bit. Uh, and you can see a really tiny 10 nanometers in length. And when you stretch them like that, 
they unravel. When you let go, they come back together. So when you see these little sticky drops on the spider's silk, actually that is like a coil um, waiting to expand and then go back again. Another one just below it expands and goes back again, making the whole thing quite elastic. Isn't that amazing? We know from resonance studies with ma ma nuclear magnetism, these proteins are already stored inside the abdomen, partly assembled, and somehow it's that vibration of the silk in those spigots that uh, turn it into an elastic product, which it needs. Now here's something you might never have come across. They've shown in studies that the silk spider spins can be given an electric charge in the atmosphere, particularly on certain days when the atmospheric uh, electricity is, is strong. This can allow the spiders to actually rise into the air and float on a strand of silk, sometimes for hundreds of kilometers to a completely different part of the world through the air. Here's a picture of a tiny spider on top of a um, dandelion puff. It's lost all its little winglet, winglets and blown away. And it's extruding this strand of silk here, which will catch the wind and lift the spider off its perch and away into the air. Here's an amazing photograph of hundreds and hundreds of tiny spiders flying through the air on strands of electrified silk. Amazing. Right, now let's see how the spider makes a web in our garden. Let's start off with a picture of the completed thing. You can see it's attached top and, uh, on the top and side there to strong branches, and there's some more bits that go down to the ground to anchor it firmly to the ground. And then you've got this, this spiral that goes round and round and round between these radial strings coming out from the center. Let's see how it all works. So at stage one, the spider climbs up a twig, upwind, floats out from its abdomen a strand of silk, which is carried on the wind and eventually snags on another piece of uh, twig or <laughs> motor car mirror or something like that, some distance down downwind. When it's anchored itself because it's sticky, the spider then travels along the silk strand to the halfway point, and then it drops down to the ground. And when it gets to the ground, it anchors the web very firmly to the ground. So now we have a, a Y shape with two branches and a, a leg going down. Next, the spider climbs back up to the center uh, of the Y, and it has extra strands of, like radiuses going away from the center to those support twigs on either side down to the ground. Here it is building what's uh, uh, looking a bit like a, um, a, 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 a river delta, uh, but it's made up of lots of different strands of silk. Eventually we have what you could call a kite shape. It's now completed big triangular shape with these radial strands going to the edge, okay? Right, what happens next? Well. Now the spider sets to work, moving from one spoke of the radius to another, round and round and round in a spiral. And it's building the scaffolding for the web. The silk it extrudes now is dry, perfectly dry. It's only there to make a framework, that, that, that circular target-shaped framework, OK? But having completed the framework, a poor old spider goes all the way around again and it eats up the framework silk as it goes and simultaneously extrudes from the back end of its abdomen the sticky silk, which is needed to catch insects. So it replaces the scaffolding silk with sticky silk as it goes along. Why does it eat it? Well, of course, that's to say wastage. That uh, scaffolding web is rich in protein. No point in throwing it away, the spider eats it and recycles it internally to make some more, in this case, sticky silk, catch insects. Here's a lovely photograph of a, a spider. You see how, how clever he is, like an acrobat, just holding on with his toes to the strand of silk behind and, be, and in front as it moves along through the air. OK, so just to complete that little picture, we start off with the first thread. It goes across a high level to another branch. Uh, we have anchor threads which come down to the ground to hold the bottom part in place. We have these radial threads going out like spokes of a wheel. And then 
First of all, it makes scaffolding threads in a spiral, and then it gobbles up all those scaffolding threads and replaces them with sticky threads uh, to, uh, to, catch its, to catch its insect prey. How does the spider hold on to the web itself and not get caught on the sticky silk itself? Well, actually, the feet of, the feet of a spider are quite, quite complicated. They have a hook, you see here, and two little branches like angel's wings, which can push down on the silk and push it away from that hook. So it can hobble along sideways, ripping the silk thread at intervals with its hook, and then pushing the silk away uh, when it wants to move on. So it's been designed to, to be able to move about safely on its own web without getting caught. <clears throat> Let me tell you now about the St Andrew's cross spider. I, I'm recording this talk actually in Australia. And in the gardens here, we often see these spiders. They're called St Andrew's cross spiders. <coughs> but of course, the web they spin has a zigzag filament in it, looking like St Andrew's cross, as you see in the Scottish flag. Now, looking at that web, you might think any self-respecting fly that came along would say, oh, there's a web here. I'm not going to fly into that one. No way. You think that white cross would make the web very visible. But the answer is no. That zigzag, which appears white to you because you're a human being, actually appears ultraviolet to a fly, which has eyes which are sensitive to ultraviolet light. And so when it sees this cross of ultraviolet light, it's actually attracted to it. We see the same kind of thing in the butcher shop. Where up on the wall, we have these ultraviolet fly killers, and we hear the flies going into them, going, getting, getting burnt up as they touch the wires. But that's the same principle. They like ultraviolet, and it attracts them, not repels them. And there's the Andrews cross spider himself, sitting bang in the middle, waiting for them to, to arrive, a bit like an aeroplane homing in on the runway, um, which has Mr. Spider waiting right at the centre. So that's, that's the Andrews cross spider here. And it's that ultraviolet cross which attracts the insects to the web. OK, let's have a think now about how could all this happen by itself? If evolution was true, somehow the spider managed to invent those things quite randomly through mutations that took place over millions of years. Obviously, the spider couldn't think what to do. It doesn't have a, a kind of a brain. It all came about uh, with those um, various stages needed to make the web um, by evolution or by God's design. Those are the two alternatives for such an amazing construction. How could the recipe for that silk an amazing product arise by random mutations. It has to be strong. It also has to be elastic if it's to be effective in catching its prey. Now, we can't make silk. We've tried and tried, but we can't make a fibre resembling silk with those amazing properties. When we make fibres, synthetic fibres, like nylon and terrilene, we have to make them in the factory, which has very high temperatures and uh, and precious to extrude the stock material through to tiny dot ducts to make a, a filament. But this, our friend the spider <laughs> makes its silk from nothing other than digested insects at room temperature. No high pressures and no high temperatures involved. For the spider, it does it all at body temperature. Okay. Now, how does that sticky coating arise? on the silk to make it catch insects. Without the stickiness, the web wouldn't catch insects. And then we know inside we, that little um, globule, we now know there's like a coiled up spring that stretches out and goes back again uh, as you release the tension. How does the spider know how to spin a web? You might think its mother teaches it how to spin a web, like perhaps uh, some birds teach their babies how to catch their food. No, that can't be so because the mother spider lays her eggs in that egg sac and then dies. And the baby spiders hatch out long after the mother's dead. So they can't communicate with her and find out how to make webs. 
they know how to map a web because they're already programmed with the order of what to do to make a web. It's already born with a program. In fact, so automatic is that program, you could play play tricks on the spider. You now they get to, you get to the place where it's made the scaffolding silk. Now it's going around a second time, gobbling up that scaffolding and replacing it with sticky silk. Now, if you're naughty and go in with a pair of scissors, you can actually clip out the scaffolding silk advanced in advance of where it's reached. In which case, it will come to a gap. It'll feel with its feet, and there won't be any silk there for it to, to advance onto because there's a gap. And sometimes the spider is able to seal to, uh, to cover the gap and, and carry on, but sometimes it just gives up. Gives up altogether and starts a brand new web because it's lost its way in the program. But you know, programs don't write themselves. Somebody has to write a program, whether it's Mr. Google or somebody else like that. Our laptops won't work unless we use a program that somebody else has thought through very carefully and engineered over many years. Well, in the case of the spider, who wrote the program? That's the question. And so we feel, as Bible students, there is only one answer to this, this kind of question. That's the one essential part of that pyramid of life which God created in the beginning. He, he made creeping things. Creeping things. And the spider's one of the creeping things. The spider's essential to our lives. It's one of those devices that controls the numbers of insects. We didn't have spiders. The fly population would, would explode. As we've seen, this, this spider, this little chap who lives in our garden, this little chap who lives in our garden has remarkable features which have to reflect the wisdom of God. This is what we would say. And it's there in Genesis chapter 1, verse 24. God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And that's on day six of creation. And so, says the psalmist in Psalm 148, beasts and cattle, creeping things and flying fowls, kings of the earth and people, princes and judges, young men, maidens, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent, and his glory is above the earth and heaven. So we can say, yes, Lord, I accept. You are the great creator. I marvel at your wisdom and your wonderful designs. And we hope one day in your kingdom, all men will come to realize that you are the great eternal God who made us all and has set before us the hope of your kingdom. So that's it, folks. I hope you've enjoyed this little talk about uh, another of God's mighty, uh, wonderful creations, creations. And I hope perhaps we'll come back and listen to some more. Bye for now. Thank you.